Hello and welcome to Parks and Rec at Home. This is your way to enjoy our parks from your from your home. And if you are out in the park, um, being socially uh, distant and uh, responsible, uh, this might help you inform your visit. I'm Tony Crozdale, Environmental Education Program Specialist at Cobbs Creek Environmental Center with Bernard Brown of the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey. Bernard, would you like to take it away? I would be happy to, Tony. So thanks, um, thanks to you and thanks for Parks and Recreation for uh, inviting me to do this. Um, I spend a lot of time looking for reptiles and amphibians around Philadelphia. And a lot of that time is in uh, parks and recreation parks. Uh, and I'll, I'll start, I mean, I don't, I don't think I planned it this way, uh, but in the slideshow, that handful of salamanders right there is from under one log at Cobbs Creek. Um, so right there, we got a Philly Parks uh, amphibian pile right there. Um, and we'll actually start with, uh, with amphibians. And I, I'll, I'll start actually by saying, what is an amphibian? Um, I think the, we throw these terms around like we know what, like everybody should know what they are. Um, but it, there, are, uh, there are animals with four legs, usually. Um, some of them have two or no legs, but most of them have four legs. They have wet skin, usually damp, that, uh, that doesn't have, for the most part, the kind of ha the harder stuff on the top of it, keratin so much that that we think of our skin being dry, you know. And most, perhaps most importantly, they have eggs that don't have a, um, a leathery or, or like hard shell on them. Um, so they have eggs that, that are actually pretty vulnerable to drying out. Um, so when you think of reptiles, like sort of that, that often get lumped together with amphibians, reptiles tend to have dry, very dry skin with a hard layer of keratin on top. And keratin's the stuff that's our hair and our fingernails. It's also a component in our skin. Um, and reptiles also have, their default is to have eggs that have some kind of shell that contains moisture. And that way they, it opens up more places you can lay eggs, right? And so reptiles, sometimes their shells are, are kind of hard, like a bird egg or something like that. Um, sometimes they're leathery which is what we think of most snake eggs or lizard eggs. Um, but that's a big difference there between them and the amphibians. So when we talk about amphibians in Philadelphia, uh, we've got a few groups of them. Um, basically, we've got salamanders, we've got frogs, we have toads. Um, once you get into other parts of the world, let's say if we were in South America, we'd talk about other stuff. But for here, we're going to lead off with salamanders. And I'm leading off with the most common and maybe the most important salamander in Philadelphia, uh, which is called the red back salamander. These guys are little. They were in that first title slide for the presentation. Here they are, um, one in uh, on the ground. I'm pretty sure that one on the left, I took a picture of that in Carpenter's Woods. I'm really not so sure about the other ones on the right, but what I wanted to show you is that there are two different color phases for these guys. Um, you could guess that the one on the left with the, with the reddish brown back right there, uh, that one is where you get the name red-backed salamander. The ones on the right, um, which you can have actually in the same clutch of eggs, they're just some of them are, are, di are different colors. Um, the ones on the right lack that red back and are commonly called lead back salamanders, just because it rhymes with red back. Um, and these guys, they live in leaf litter mostly. Um, they eat, uh, I mean, they eat Little things smaller than they are. <laughs> so they'll eat um, worms and insects and spiders. Um, and you can think of them prowling around at night looking for, for smaller critters to eat. Uh, during the daytime, they stay undercover mostly. And I should say that these guys are, um, you know, if you, if you, the way you find them is if you're not going out at night and shining a spotlight around or a flashlight around, the way you find them is you look under logs, you look under rocks, you look under um, stuff uh, where they might be hiding. And sometimes that can be, most of the time that's in a wooded place. So like a wooded park, like, you know, Fairmount Parks, East and West, Stokoni, Pennypack, Cobbs Creek, Wissahickon, et cetera. Um, you'll find these guys under, under tons of stuff once you start looking. Um, you'll find them when it's not so hot out. 
So one of the key points about these salamanders, um, and a lot of amphibians for that matter, is that they're very, very vulnerable to drying out. Like I was talking about earlier about what their skin is like um, and what their eggs are like. This means that they've got limits for how hot and dry they can take it. Um, so once you get into, um, let's say a month from now, once you're well into June and July, you won't find so many of these under stuff. Um, but then once you get back into like the fall, into November, all the way through the winter into the spring, then you'll find a lot more of them. I say, even in the winter, um, I have gone out on days when it's in, let's say the high 30s or low 40s, there's patches of snow on the ground, um, but I'll still find them undercover because they, they can actually take it pretty cold. Um, and once it gets hotter and warmer, they basically retreat underground and go deeper and deeper. And I mentioned that these guys are important. Um, you might say, why are a couple of three inch salamanders important? The reason is because there's so many of them. Um, when, you, when you go out in the woods, you might find you know, a few of these every square yard, right? And you multiply that by like how many, how much leaf litter and understory there is in the woods all around you. And you realize that these guys play a pretty important role in the ecosystem of the forest floor, right? And so that means the ecosystem of how leaves get broken down to soil, how trees get nutrients from the ground, all of those things. And so they're actually, you know, we think of what's, what are the, the, what we should care about conservation wise. Funnily enough, these guys might be tops on our list. There's nothing threatening them. Um, but these are the kind of animal that if something happened to them, they might have big effects for the forest. Well, one I'm thing threatening them might be earthworms. We used to have a lot more leaf litter until the invasive earthworm arrived. So we, as many as we see now, we might have had way more before earthworms ate all the leaf litter. Tony makes a really good point. Um, we, we, especially if you come from a gardening perspective, you might think, oh yeah, earthworms are great. But actually Philadelphia um, didn't have any native, if I'm right on this, any native earthworms up until uh, European colonization. Um, and now we have various European and, and East Asian earthworms. And what they do, like Tony's saying, is they, they, they eat leaf litter. And so leaf litter gets broken down so much faster. And so if you go to woods that, um, one way to think of it is you tend not to find earthworms in woods that were never um, cleared and used for agriculture. Um, and so, so much of Philadelphia, and really so much of Pennsylvania has been logged and maybe farmed at one point and then the woods grew back. Those kind of places you see the earthworms. Um, but sometimes you get into a patch of woods and you realize your leaf litter is deeper. Um, you realize that the soil is much more knitted together with fungal um, hyphae. It's sort of, it's, it's the, what, what's happening there is that um, the leaf litter is taking longer to break down. You have a whole different forest floor ecology there. And, it's, and it, it is indeed much better. You, you find way more salamanders there. And there are hillsides in, let's say, the Wissahickon, Tony, um, where I'll go to look for these, where I'll go and I'll, and like every rock you look under, there's like three of these. Um, and those are also places where you see more leaf litter um, and not so many earthworms. Um, so we're going to hop along to other salamanders. Now, I'll say for the redbacks, one of the things that makes them interesting as a salamander is that they don't have an aquatic life phase. Um, and so most amphibians are like what we think of frogs and toads, where they lay eggs in water. There are something like a tadpole. With salamanders, they tend to come out with legs and, and but external gills. Um, but then, you know, they, they at some point transform, they go through metamorphosis and end up as a, an adult that can go between land and water. I mean, that's what amphibian means. You can go both aquatic and terrestrial. Um, so redbacks, actually back up when I'm talking about this. Redbacks, um, they lay eggs um, that, that are on, the, on land or really, you know, under a rock, in a moist place under a rock. The female guards those eggs, but then when they hatch out, they hatch out in, as land-dwelling or terrestrial babies um, that look just like the adults, just tiny. Um, once you get to the other salamander species we have in Philadelphia, what you have is salamanders that lay their eggs in the water usually in running water like streams and, and maybe our larger creeks, but they tend to like smaller running water. Um, they lay their eggs in the water, um, the eggs hatch out into aquatic uh, larvae, kind of like tadpoles, like I said. Um, and then the adults then are, they tend to stick closer to the water 
and off it will sort of go in between. They'll, go, they'll spend some of the time in the water, some time out of the water. Um, and we usually refer to these as stream side or stream bed salamanders. These two guys right here are, um, are closely related. The one on the left is something called a long-tailed salamander. The one on the right is a two-lined salamander. Both of these guys are from the Wissahick and Tony. And um, they, they are, like I said, um, salamanders that, that go back and forth between water and land. The two lines are much more common. Um, you know, water in an urban setting is a rough place to be because you have, um, every time you have a big storm, um, water runs off the pavement, it, it carries warmth into the water, which when you think about how water can hold oxygen, the oxygen levels fall um, because it gets warmer and it carries pollution into the water. The force of the water scours the stream beds. And so um, what you find is that, uh, you know, once the streams get bad enough, you can't even find any salamanders. Um, but the two line salamanders, again, the one on the right, these tend to be the last salamander standing in a stream, right? So if you've got any salamanders in the stream in Philadelphia, it's gonna be your two lines. And then if, um, if the water conditions are better, you'll have more species in there, maybe including the long tail salamanders. Um, and I'll pop along to uh, a couple other species you see sometimes in streams around Philadelphia. Those, the ones on the left, the, the muddy looking salamander there is called a dusky salamander. Um, and when, you, when I look at it, what things I notice is, is, are that the tail is a little bit keeled, a little bit flattened, which helps them move through the water. Um, they've got eyes that kind of sit more on the top of their heads, um, kind of a bug-eyed look to them. Uh, these duskies you, you see in a lot of streams, um, and I should say not just streams, but um, it, you know, when you go all the way up to, the head, to where a stream starts in a hillside, right? Um, it's a spring, sometimes it looks like a seep, it's just like a wet patch of soil in a forest. Um, these are places where you'll also find these dusky salamanders. Um, and again, like the other two ones we just looked at, they lay their eggs in the water, they hatch out into aquatic larvae, and then transform into adults that can go back and forth a little bit between land and water. Same thing for the one on the right called a red salamander. These guys get to be a little bigger. This is a small one I'm holding right there. Um, they are uh, yeah, pretty striking looking. Um, I know I have found you know, I'm about to say this, I, I don't think I have found a living red salamander in Philadelphia. Um, I know Tony has. Uh, what was that, below Houston Meadow? Yeah, uh, I was actually leading, yeah, below Houston Meadow, I was leading a, a group um, for an after school program, and I found this, uh, a little spring. I was like, oh, this looks like a good spot for red salamander, and first rock I picked up, there's red salamander. Uh, and then uh, uh, students found two other ones. And I also found a dusky, which at the time was the first one um, entered into uh, PARS, which I know you're going to explain later. I am. I am. And that's impressive. I'd, I'd say that kind of luck is fabulous. And I wish I had it. Because um, <laughs> red salamanders, are, they are pretty salamanders. And if you're with the school group and you're trying to get people to care about slimy little squirmy things, it's good to start with something that's that attractive, you know, so that bright orange. Um, but again, yeah, so these are salamanders that are stream bed or stream side salamanders or seep salamanders. And uh, they, um, you can find them in woods. And, and one thing you're looking for, like where you're talking about, Tony, um, is you've got a stream that the area that it's draining is not all that paved, right? So if you think of where you were talking about, there's a, a lot of upland above the, the spring that is, hill, that, is, that is meadow and forest. And so the water running into the stream is buffered in a way. And so this is, incidentally, this is what our water department's working on right now um, with our Green City Clean Waters program um, to try to, to make, the, basically help water um, seep more slowly into Philadelphia. So it doesn't just rush right into our, our, our streams and rivers. And they're doing it because they want to avoid having sewage overflows, which is a big important thing for you know, Clean Water Act compliance and human health. But incidentally, that should also do a lot for our salamanders and other stream life that lives in streams in Philadelphia. Um, now, you know, salamanders, they tend to be underneath things during the daytime. Um, you find them if you go looking for them. Uh, and maybe if you happen to be out at night with a flashlight, which you don't have much in parks because most of the time that's against the rules. 
Um, frogs and toads are much more visible. And so you see them, they, they are diurnal. They're out during the day for the most part. They sing, they call, so they're, they're obvious that way. Um, and two of the ones that we see the most around Philadelphia are green frogs and bullfrogs. These are closely related. Um, and I'm going to show you more close-ups in a minute. But this is how you usually see them, right? You see them from far away, you get close and they jump in the water and you sort of lost them. It can be, um, I guess I'd say for grown-ups, it's a frustrating experience. Little kids are the ones who are really good at grabbing frogs. Um, so the one on the left, I think is from uh, Concourse Lake in Fairmont Park West. The one on the right is a bullfrog at uh, the banks of Cobbs Creek, um, right across from where the environmental center is. We're gonna get a little closer on them. Um, the one on the left here is a green frog. Now green frogs are smaller than bullfrogs, a little more, I'd say mobile. They, 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 they venture further away from the water than the bullfrogs do. Um, one way you can tell them apart, and this is getting a bit into the weeds, um, but if you look at this, this green frog and you look where its eyes are, um, you see it's got two little ridges of skin that kind of go back toward, like along its back. Um, green frogs have those and bullfrogs don't. Um, so if you can get a clean look at your frog, um, that's one way you can tell those two apart. I'm gonna actually bounce around a little bit, Tony. I was thinking about this. Um, this next slide shows a bullfrog, again, and a, and a, 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 a tadpole transforming into a bullfrog. Um, both of these from the Cobbs Creek area. Uh, the one on the right, that big bullfrog, we found under something doing an invasive species plant, you know, weed clearing thing. Um, in one of the fields near the creek. Uh, and both green frogs and bullfrogs, they, uh, they take usually more than a year to transform from, go from egg to uh, a, a land dwelling frog, right? Um, so they lay their eggs in the summer, early summer maybe, the eggs will hatch out, the tadpoles will be in the water, the tadpoles will overwinter in the water, and then the next year they'll fully absorb that tail and hop out of the water to be what we usually call, call froglets. You know, it's a cute term and they're cute things. Um, I'm gonna back up to that previous slide and show the one on the right. The one on the right is something called a pickerel frog. Now pickerel frogs are, you see them um, maybe a little less around Philadelphia. I think of these as frogs that tend to be in marshy areas or in streams. Um, I, I tend not to see them in ponds and lakes and that kind of thing. Um, but they will often be in the forest floor further away from the water. Um, when you get close to them, they, they sort of rocket off into the water. Um, one of the things you're looking at for these guys is these squarish blotches on their backs. Their pattern has this kind of sort of blocky look to it. Um, and that's one of the things you're looking at when you're looking at pickerel frogs. I often find these when I'm looking under rocks in streams. I'll be in a stream looking for, let's say, the streamside salamanders we were talking about before. And the frog that you find in that situation, sometimes it's a green frog, a lot of times it's a pickerel frog. Um, this next one is one that you almost never see, um, but you hear. So this is a spring peeper. Um, and it's about the size of my thumbnail. Uh, these are small, these are tiny frogs, basically. Um, in case you're curious about how they're related to other frogs, these are basically tree frogs that don't live in trees. Um, but the spring peepers, again, they, they have maybe the most perfect common name you could have for a frog because it tells you exactly what they do. They have a peep call and they sing in the spring. Um, so early spring, if you're, and, and I you know Tony and I were talking about this earlier, if you're, there's some places in the Penny Pack, um, Heinz National Wildlife Refuge has a ton of these. Um, you'll go in early spring and you can't hear anything else. <laughs> like it's just deafening spring peepers, singing their hearts out. Um, you'll, you'll still hear them, the, sometimes like if the weather is a little bit cool and it's a little bit wet, you'll hear one or two male spring peepers calling, even though it's like not their breeding season at all. Um, and sometimes you'll think, what the heck kind of bird is that? Um, and then you realize it's just an out of season spring peeper. Uh, but sometimes you'll see them. Um, and I'll point out on the back, you see the, the markings are in a bit of an X. Their scientific name is, uh, um, I almost blanked on it, Sudacris crucifer. So a crucifer refers to the cross on their back. Um, and so that's one of the, one of the key markers for these guys. Um, otherwise you'd think it was like a froglet of something else, but no, these are tiny little guys with a huge voice. Um, 
the 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 much more common uh, for a frog that we see or a toad that we see around Philadelphia is the American toad. Um, they, aside from just having what I think of as like a so ugly they're cute kind of look, they always look like they're a little grumpy and dis, just 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 disappointed with everything. Um, uh, Billy, would you mind um, explaining the difference between a toad and a frog, or that a toad is a type of frog? Of course, yeah. So we we think a lot of us in common speech we think of like frogs and toads as being very different things, like they're different categories. It's better to think of toads as frogs that have some things in common. So when frogs, most frogs you think of have a damp skin on their back. Um, they move pretty fast. You get close to most frogs and bam, they're gone. Um, toads have rougher skin that's drier. Um, they tend to be slower. Um, but there's really, but there are toads all over the world that are basically not each other's closest relatives is one way to think of it. Um, they are just frogs that share these characteristics. Um, and so when you're talking about the relationships among frogs and toads, you would just talk about them all. There's a, there's a scientific word you use, A-N-U-R-A-N-S. I didn't print it in the slideshow, but anorans. Um, all of them are those. And then some of them that are like rougher and wordier are the ones we call toads. Um, so in North America, we have this group of, one group of toads that we're looking at right now. Um, there's a bunch of species of these. In Philadelphia, um, there's a one little corner of Philadelphia, you might find another kind of toad, but really they're almost all American toads, the same species. If you're other parts of Pennsylvania, especially in New Jersey and then on south, you have something called a spadefoot toad, um, which is a wonderful little toad, but basically it's not related to these toads at all. It just is also another um, slower moving, rougher, drier skinned frog. Um, but in any case, uh, why do they move slow? Well, it's because they're poisonous. If, if, you know, if you're a dog or you're a fox or a raccoon and you see this toad and you, and you think, oh, yummy, it's a slow moving frog, you grab it in your mouth. And then if you look behind their eyes, you see these big bumps like around their ears. Um, those are poison glands. And if I had chosen to squeeze one of those, <laughs> you would have seen this milky fluid pop out. Um, and if I had chosen to lick that milky fluid, this, we're going down a weird path here, um, my mouth would have been, I guess it would have been a lot of pain. I would have sort of frothing at the mouth, maybe thrown up. Um, and it would be something I never want to do again in my life. And that's the point. So that when a fox grabs one of these, it never does it again. <laughs> it learns its lesson and leaves them alone. Um, and the trade-off for that, which is kind of fun from a human perspective, is that they're easy to catch. Um, and so if you want to pick one up and take a look at it, uh, you can, where it's a lot harder to do that with a green frog. Now, you want to wash your hands, um, not rub your eyes right away, that kind of thing. Um, it's not the kind of poison that can really kill you or will even hurt you if you avoid ingesting it, um, which again, if you're not licking the toad, you're probably safe. But um, I'd say wash your hands after you play around with these guys. Um, they are, uh, they're, I think pretty much anywhere we got woods in Philadelphia, you got American toads. I've heard of some weird places like in Fishtown they've popped up, Tony, but mainly like if you're in um, like the Wistahickon or Cobbs Creek, uh, I, I like to point out, or in any of our wooded parks, uh, I was like to point out, I've mentioned this to Tony before, but one time Tony had like, lucked out and gotten a whole bunch of, Tony and I are friends off of this, um, and he got a whole bunch of, of garden plants and I was picking some up and he left them outside because he worked at the center and he left them outside the center and I was going to pick them up there. And I saw the biggest toad I'd ever seen in my life um, camped out underneath one of the lights on the outside of the, the center. Um, and this is something that you see a lot if you're in a place with toads um, even if you're in a suburban area with toads in your yard, under your garage light, you might see them hanging out. Because what they're doing is they're waiting for moths or other bugs to land and they snap them up. It's an easy meal. Um, so these are pretty common. They breed in, uh, you know, usually around April. They have a pretty high pitched trilling call. Um, they will migrate back to where the water is um, to breed. And, you know, you know, 400 years ago, that wasn't that big a deal. You could migrate anywhere as a toad and be pretty safe. These days, um, 
cars make it a lot harder. Um, if you're a slow moving frog um, that really doesn't have to run very fast from predators, you know, that, that works with a fox, it doesn't work with a, with a, a Subaru. Um, and so we see in some places, a great example is uh, around the Schoolkill Center by the East Park, sorry, I keep saying that, the, the Roxborough Reservoir <laughs> um, along Port, Port Royal. Uh, they shut down the road there um, do a, doing a toad crossing program where um, volunteers can come out and help the toads cross the road and help count them. It's a great education exercise that also saves a lot of toads' lives so they don't get flattened by cars because um, they've got to, in the spring, they've got to migrate out to the pools of water where they're going to breathe. They breathe, and the adults hop back out to their territory, wherever that is. Then when the tadpoles transform into toadlets, the toadlets then have to migrate out into the woods. And so they've got a few, few times they've got to cross roads. And every time that happens, it's, they're vulnerable. Um, so it's a great program to get into if you want to get out there and take a look at and really and, and handle some toads. It's a great way to do it. Um, I do want to mention that as I've been talking about amphibians and how they have skin that, uh, that is usually moist and uh, is, is actually one of the ways that they um, exchange oxygen, you know, which we all need to live. Um, and get rid or exchange it for getting rid of carbon dioxide, which is something that builds up in our bodies when we use oxygen. Um, they do a lot of that through their skin. Um, and that permeable skin is vulnerable to chemicals you might have on your hands. Um, so if you so don't pick up a toad or a salamander or a frog, if you did just put on bug spray or had a lot of lotions on or something like that, um, because they can absorb that through your skin. What I often do is I'll bring along gla a glass jar. And so when I catch something like a redback salamander or a toad or anything, um, and I, I'm on a, let, let's say I'm leading a walk, um, I'll put them in the jar and then pass the jar around. And that way people can get a good look at the animal without touching it. Um, I, I, I forgot to mention this with the, the, the redback salamanders and the other ones we're talking about. All of those salamanders actually completely lack lungs. Sometime in their evolution, um, they were doing, you know, they were doing such a good job of, of getting oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide through their skin, they just didn't need the lungs anymore. Um, so those are lungless salamanders. So again, that skin is so important to them, it's why you got to be a little delicate with them when you're handling them. Um, I'll hold them sometimes, like here on the left, just for a quick picture, just for literally a few seconds, and you put them back. Tony, you got any thoughts about toads? That's okay. Um, I got a thumbs up, um, so let's move on. Uh, here's some more toad pictures. Um, actually, this is one from that toad crossing picture. Um, and here is a, uh, a, a toadlet. This is what happens after their tadpoles. You can see by the scale of that picture with the dime, they're incredibly tiny, incredibly cute. Um, now let's move on to reptiles. Now reptiles, um, these, are, these, are, these are animals that live on land. They have uh, you know, skin that is, um, like we talked about before, harder, more dor like tougher. Um, their eggs are resistant to drying out because they got an extra layer on them, um, usually leathery or hard, like, a, like we think of like a bird egg. Um, and the kinds that we have in Philadelphia, we break down into a few groups. Um, we are, I like to say, unlucky that we don't have crocodilians in Philadelphia, so no alligators or crocodiles. Um, Maybe give it 200 years of global warming, but for now, don't have to think about them. Um, we do have a few lizards, not many. If you want to find lots of lizards, um, you want to go to the southwest of the United States, um, where it's drier and lizards really dominate. I like to think that the lizards out there take the place of the salamanders. Um, and if you, it, it was funny, Tony and I do a podcast together. In one episode, I talked to a, 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 a woman who was researching lizards in Australia, and they have just like, it, wherever she, I forget where she was, Tony, but they have dozens of species of geckos and skinks and stuff and monitor lizards. And when she was, I shared some data that I had on collecting or observing reptiles and amphibians in Philadelphia. And she was like, but wait, you only have like one species of lizard documented. Were you looking for lizards? I was like, no, no, we don't have very many species of lizards. Um, and so this one is really our only the only native lizard species you find in Philadelphia. It's called a five-line skink. Um, the only place we seem to find them is along the waterfront, along the Delaware River waterfront, and our parks along there. So that's where you're gonna keep an eye out for them. Go ahead, Tony, you got a point? 
Except if you're me and you find one at 47th and Springfield. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tony found one skink, uh, which we named Skink Vicious, um, in the middle of the road. We had a very funny conversation about that where he calls me. And I was like, you did not find a skink. And he's like, yes, I am. It's biting my hand right now. Um, and so I talked to, so there's construction going on at a church right next to that spot. Um, I talked a little bit to the workmen there and they had a lot of equipment coming in from yards at Delaware and in Jersey um, where you do find five line skinks and no one else around there or anywhere where in West or Southwest Philly, as far as I know, has ever seen a five line skink. So my guess is it hitchhiked in on equipment. Um, but for the most part, we see them along the Delaware River waterfront uh, and they are fast little suckers. Sometimes you'll find them undercover and can grab them that way. Um, I think, Tony, that middle picture is skink vicious. Um, the one on the right uh, is, is a picture through the bark of some tree, of a tree. So that's one hiding, just visible, just barely visible. The one on the left, because they get out of, get out of view pretty fast, um, is how I often get pictures of them, you know, bad pictures, grainy. Um, you see that it's got a blue tail. Um, the females, and particularly the younger skinks, have bright blue tails, and they also will lose their tails uh, sort of by design, or, or by evolution, I should say, that a predator will, will be, will, their focus will be drawn to that bright blue, so that a bird, probably birds in particular, because um, birds have color vision for the most part, um, will go after them, grab the tail, the tail will fall off and keep twitching, um, and the lizard will run away. Um, and, and live to, to regrow the tail and see, you know, and live. Um, and uh, that's, you know, it's, it's something that uh, you see in a lot of other lizards. Um, some geckos do the same kind of thing. Uh, we actually have geckos in Philadelphia. I didn't get them into the slideshow because they're, they're only in a few places, a few neighborhoods. Um, the geckos we have are European or Asian geckos that, have, that are sort of colonize all over the world because they ride along in like uh, shipping containers. So a few of those, but, but I, I, maybe next time we do this, I'll talk more about them. But in our parks, you're not gonna see the geckos, you might see some skinks. Um, we have more snakes than we have lizards. Uh, so we have, um, I'm starting off with the, the snake that you see most in Philadelphia. Sometimes people tell me, hey, you know, I, I found this baby garter snake in my yard. Um, and I'll ask them about it a little bit, and it becomes clear that the, what they actually found was this snake, it's called a brown snake. Um, sometimes it's called a decayed snake, it's named after, some, the scientific name is named after someone named Decay, D-E-K-A-Y. Um, but mostly, you know, people on, who do this kind of thing call them brown snakes. Uh, they get to be, the one in my hand um, on the left, the, the lighter colored one with the tail flipped over, that's about as big as they get. Um, and they're usually s smaller than that. So these are not big snakes. They, I've never had one even try to bite me, but this teeth aren't big enough to break your skin. They are not at all dangerous to people. The worst they do is poop on you. Um, and like all snakes, they have musk glands that smells awful. Um, and so when you pick them up, you get that musk on you. Um, that's another one of their anti-predator responses, right? So if you're a fox and you, you take a bite of that, you might let go because it just stings awfully. Um, so you find these, uh, you find them sometimes undercover in the woods, you find them in marshy areas, you find them in vacant lots, you find them in gardens, you find them in cemeteries, you find them along railroad tracks. If you go right in wherever you are in Philadelphia, if you find a vacant lot with, you know, overgrown with weeds and, and objects on the ground, you go to like along a railroad track, you go um, at the edge of a cemetery or a park and look under the stuff along the edges, you'll find some of these. Might not, maybe not on your first try, but you know, a few tries you'll find them and then you might find a lot of them. Um, and so they're the ones that when people find them in their gardens, they're almost always brown snakes. Um, I adore them, I think they're adorable. I know not everybody feels that way. Um, if you're looking for a reason to convince your neighbors not to kill these, <laughs> tell them that they eat slugs. Indeed, they do eat slugs. Um, and so they eat a lot of slugs, and it's probably their favorite food. Uh, and so, you know, no gardener likes having slugs around. So maybe that'll help them spare the brown snakes. Um, next up, in terms of common snakes, are garter snakes. 
Um, people sometimes refer to these as garden, gardener or gardening snakes. The name actually comes from an article of clothing we tend not to wear anymore. Before socks had elastic in them, uh, you know, men's socks were held up by straps around their calves called garters, right? G-A-R-T-E-R. -E um, and they had often had stripes. And so um, garter snakes apparently looked like those stripes. Um, you often find them, uh, you find them undercover sometimes. You find them along water, so near streams, um, near ponds, that kind of thing. These guys have a broader diet than the brown snakes. These guys will eat um, fish, they'll eat frogs, they'll eat toads, they'll eat salamanders, um, they'll eat worms, uh, and uh, yeah, they are. Um, they get bigger. The one on the left in my hand is is probably a baby. Uh, I can't remember when I took that picture. It might have been in the spring, a baby from the previous year. The one on the right, um, I did not intentionally do this with trash in the background, but uh, this is uh, on the banks of Cobbs Creek right there. Um, this is sort of often how you see them in real life, sort of crawling along the edge of the water or just crawling out of the water. Um, I wanted to, these two pictures to make a point. Um, you know, people will ask, well, does it bite? Which, and I'm not sure if they mean does it bite or is it dangerous? Um, these guys are not at all dangerous. Um, Tony is a cat guy. Um, I like to point out that no snake that we have in Philadelphia can hurt you worse than, let's say, a cat that wants to get off your lap. Um, if you ever had a cat like dig its claws and was trying to jump out of your arms or something like that or off of your lap, that's worse than any of these snakes can do to you. Um, and so a garter snake might draw a little bit of blood with a few little pinpricks, um, but that's about it. Um, now, they, you, that might be more than you want to deal with. And in that case, just don't pick them up. Um, but you should think of these as harmless. Uh, incidentally, um, and I'm going to lose some people here at this, I know, but technically you could call these venomous. Um, by that I mean that they have saliva that is probably a little bit toxic for the stuff that they eat. So if you're a frog and you get bitten by a garter snake and it's chewing on you and getting ready to eat you, you as the frog might feel a little bit woozy and that makes it easier for the garter snake to swallow you. Um, but they don't have fangs that can get it into your blood and it's not that powerful. And so when it bites you, it's just a couple pin bricks. Um, and all the poop and musk I was talking about before, which really is the main, the main thing you want to avoid if you're going to try to pick one of these guys up. Um, we have a few other kinds of snakes that are all less common than garter snakes and brown snakes. I'd say 95% of the time you find a snake in Philadelphia, it's a brown snake or it's a garter snake. We've got a few spots in the city um, where you can find ringneck snakes. I think these guys are from uh, Cobbs Creek and the Wissahickon. Um, ringneck snakes, gorgeous little snakes, um, not very big, about the same size range as the brown snakes. Um, they mostly eat salamanders um, and live undercover in the woods. Uh, so you might find them under rocks in the woods, but only in a few patches around Philadelphia. Always a treat to find because they're so pretty. We've got milk snakes, um, which are some of my favorites and of kinds of snakes you find. Uh, they're named after the myth that they would suck the milk out of the udders of cows. Um, now this is based on the fact that you find a lot of them around barns. Why did you find them in barns? Because they eat mice. Um, and so if you got a lot of mice, milk snakes could be attracted to that. Um, you, 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 I find them, I, I find that they are wide, I'll put it this way, widely distributed around the green spaces of Northwest Philadelphia, but nowhere are they easy to find. Um, so it's the kind of thing that someone will just find them crawling through the yard, but they don't seem to find them again for a few years. I found one in 2005 in the Wissahickon, and I looked for 10 years <laughs> to find another Philly milk snake. Um, and that one I th on the right is a baby one that I found uh, uh, in, I'm not going to say exactly where, but in the broader Wissahickon, let's say. Um, but after 10 years of looking under a lot of rocks to try to find one. Um, the other one on the other side is one that I found outside of the city um, in, elsewhere in Pennsylvania. That's, that's what they look like when they're all grown up. Um, these guys uh, are, are um, they start off with a much prettier pattern when they're babies. That fades a bit when they're older. Um, they tend not to bite. Um, so you could, this is one that you might pick up uh, and find that, again, it pooped on you, it musked on you, probably won't bite you. And even if it does bite you, like I said, 
it's not going to be as bad as what your cat could do to you or what your cat probably did to you the last time you tried to clean its ears out. Um, we've got a few other kinds of snakes you might see around Philadelphia. We've got water snakes, the ones on the left. Um, you see these in our creeks. Um, sometimes they make it out of the creek a little bit, but mostly they're in the water. Um, these guys will bite and they'll bite hard. Um, of all the snakes we have in Philadelphia, these are maybe tied with the racers as the ones you, that, will, that will scratch you up the worst. Um, but again, if you don't want that to happen, just leave them alone. Um, water snakes mostly eat fish and frogs. Um, the one on the right is a black rat snake. I will own and say this, this is my favorite reptile or amphibian ever. Um, and we are lucky to have a few of these around Philadelphia, um, mostly along greener areas along our rivers. Um, and within that, I'll narrow it down. I'll say the Delaware River waterfront, um, you see them in parks up and down the Delwater, Delaware River waterfront from Pennypack. Um, I know uh, Glenn, I'm gonna say this right, Tony, Glenn Ford on the Delaware. Um, and then you, they pop up uh, in some of the parks like around Washington Avenue Green, that kind of thing. South Philly, they seem to be um, in some park spaces in Southwest. Um, so they pop up occasionally in Bartram's Garden, um, but they're a special find wherever you find them in Philadelphia. Rat snakes are probably our longest snake. They can get to um, seven feet long. Most of them are not that long. Um, as the name implies, these guys eat warm-blooded animals. So these are, they eat rats. <laughs> they eat, uh, and they also will climb, they're good climbers, so they'll raid bird's nests, um, you'll find them basking up in trees, that kind of thing. Um, I forget, I think I might have one, let me just double check how many more slides after this. Turtles and that's it, all right. Um, so we have a few black racers in Philadelphia. These guys can look a lot like black, black rat snakes. They are much faster. Um, they tend to stick to the ground. They'll eat almost anything they can swallow and they get to be similar sizes. Um, again, you're going to have to work to try to catch one of these, um, so they're not a threat at all. Um, if you see one, take a picture, and then it'll probably dash away um, and go try to catch itself a mouse or a bird or a frog or something like that. Um, they pop up occasionally in the Cobbs Creek area, FDR Park, um, parks along the Delaware, uh, but again, a special snake if you find one. We're going we're gonna to wind up with turtles, uh, maybe the most charismatic animal that we got in all their category. I mean, everyone loves turtles. You might have to work to convince your neighbor to like your brown snakes or the frogs, but really everyone loves turtles. Um, box turtles are actually pretty rare in Philadelphia. Um, and a lot of that is because crossing roads is really hard for a turtle and there's a lot of roads in Philadelphia. Um, it's also because people take them home. Um, the sort of mommy can I keep it, uh, is something that it might seem harmless if you're taking home a turtle. Um, but there's a lot of people doing that and it adds up. Um, and so box turtles are actually in decline almost anywhere anyone has studied them well enough to tell that, um, which means they're doing worse than we think. They live a long time, so you can still have a few of them lingering around even when the whole population is in trouble. Um, so if you find one in Philadelphia, take a picture. Don't don't take it home. God, don't move it. Um, just let it be uh, and be feel lucky that you saw it. Um, box turtles are named that because they can shut, they can close up their shell really tightly. I've got an image of one on its back just to show the. I didn't leave it on its back. I turned it right over after that. But that way you sort of see how that shell closes up tight and protects it. Um, more commonly, we have water turtles that live in the water. Um, these are all pictures of, of snapping turtles. Um, snapping turtles, like so many of the ones we're things we're talking about, yes, these actually could hurt you if they bite you, but they're only going to hurt you or bite you if you pick them up. Um, I have stepped on snapping turtles by accident multiple times when I've been wading around in water. Never has one snapped at me until I grabbed it and picked it up. <laughs> um, the, one, the, you know, the ones on the left are from outside the city, but I've, I mean, one of the biggest snapping turtles I ever found, I, I saw and actually tried to catch in the Nanyang Towpath Canal. Um, but the uh, ones on the right, I think, are both from the Heinz National Wildlife Refuge, where sometimes you can see them buried into the mud in the impoundment when you're in the boardwalk. Um, I think we're running low on time, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit or go kind of quickly. Um, 
a lot of the turtles you'll find in Philadelphia, you'll see basking. Um, and here's actually a few kinds all in one log together. I think this is in the Concourse Lake in Fairmont Park West. Um, and we're gonna zero in on what these kinds are. Um, we've got painted turtles, which are a native turtle uh, and named because of the beautiful coloration around the edge of the shell. These guys um, tend to like slower water. They bask a lot, um, really pretty turtles. Um, and yeah, not much more to say about them, but please enjoy them when you see them. Uh, take a few good pictures. The closer you get, the more likely you are to spook them. Um, the one on the right, you're sh I'm showing a male with what look like scarily long claws. Those claws are actually used in courtship. Where when they're trying to seduce the female, they sort of wave those claws around in her face and kind of stroke her with the claws as part of the courtship ritual. <laughs> Tony's making courtship gestures of a painted turtle that you can't see right now. <laughs> although doing it pretty well. Um, next up, we've got a few kinds of turtles that are, that are a mix of native and not native. The one on the left with the red along the bottom of the shell, the big girl over there, that is a red-bellied turtle. Sometimes called a red-bellied cooter. Um, cooter is a, an, I forget what language originally, but an African term for these guys that got adopted into English um, from enslaved Africans in North America. Um, but the, the red-bellied cooter, it is a state-threatened turtle. I should say also the box turtles as well have a, have a, a possession limit of zero, as you would see it, um, which means you're not allowed to keep them. I would say any reptile or amphibian you catch in Philadelphia, you should have a fishing license. It sounds weird, but Fish and Boat Commission is what regulates these guys. Um, even if you're only going to do it occasionally, legally you have to have a fishing license to pick one of these up, um, whatever your reptile or amphibian. And even though you're probably not going to get busted for picking up a salamander, Think of it as a way to contribute money to the research and conservation efforts for these guys. Um, anyhow, in this picture, the one in the middle is a red-eared slider. You see these all over the place. These are the little turtles that get sold as like little green turtles in, in, in containers that are totally inadequate to take care of them. Most of them die. Um, but occasionally, people will let them go into the water, which is a terrible idea. Um, and most of them will die, but a few of them hang on and breed and might actually be crowding out our native turtles. The red eared sliders are from the middle part of the continent. Um, they're not from Philadelphia or Pennsylvania. Um, and we don't, we really shouldn't be letting them go. Um, so definitely never let a turtle go. The top right is actually another kind of slider. It's from the Southeast um, part of the country, not of Philadelphia, called a yellow bellied slider. Again, never let one of these guys or any turtle go in the water. Um, contact a reptile rescue organization if you, or if you need to try to find a way to rehome a turtle that you can't take care of. Um, here's a baby red eared slider showing what they look awfully cute, um, but this one, you know, could be alive for 80 years and outbreeding other turtles that are native to our area. Um, we've got a few other kinds. Map turtles um, are, live in our bigger rivers. Uh, they eat snails and mollusks. Um, they are actually not native to the Delaware drainage. Um, but they don't seem to be crowding anything else out or causing any problems. Um, we've got musk turtles on the right, which are cute, you know, so ugly they're cute um, turtles that you sometimes see walking along the bottom of the water. Um, I see them, for example, around Fort Mifflin, um, other parts, other marshy areas in Philadelphia. Um, last, I'm gonna wind up, I think this is it, yeah, I'm winding up with the weirdest turtle I caught in Philadelphia. Also, the best picture anyone ever took of me, thanks to Jen Britton, who snapped this picture in 2013. We were kayaking on the lower Schuylkill River. I saw what I thought was just a regular snapping turtle, and I, of course I jumped in to catch it. Um, and I pulled out a medium-sized alligator snapping turtle, um, or actually a small apple. <laughs> this is small for these guys. Clearly a released pet. Um, these guys are from the Southeast United States, not in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, and it, it just, I guess someone, again, bought one. Yes, people buy these to be pets. Let's, let's get that through your head first. Um, and then, of course, for a turtle, it's gonna, be, it's gonna grow to be huge. At some point, you just can't keep it in your apartment anymore. And someone must have dumped it in the school kill. Um, and people ask me, what I do with the turtle? And I said, I was in a kayak. I had nowhere to put it. <laughs> so it's, for all we know, it's still living in the lower school kill. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's not one you're gonna find probably, but it's kind of a funny, funny example of a turtle that, that we did find in Philadelphia. 
Um, I'm going to wind up by saying um, you can check out the Pennsylvania Amphibian Reptile Survey. This is a, a project, a citizen science project funded by the state. Um, all the data gets gets fed into it's well. It's a way that that people around Pennsylvania can contribute um, observations of reptiles and amphibians to help us develop our understanding of their biodiversity in Pennsylvania, where we need to do conservation, where they're common, where they're not common, really important baseline data. Um, and you can contribute it directly through our website. Also, if you're an iNaturalist user, um, there's a project in iNaturalist for, the, for, the, um, for PARS, where once you join that project and, and add your observations to that project, the data also ends up um, helping to, to support state conservation and research efforts. Um, so with that, I want to thank Tony again and Parks and Recreation for letting me do this. Um, and, you know, Philadelphia at paherbsurvey.org will get to me. Um, and, you know, if you contact, uh, well, a lot of ways to follow up to this. Um, and happy to keep on educating people about reptiles and amphibians in Philadelphia. Thanks, Tony. And thank you, Billy, for doing this. Um, really appreciate it. Really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. And maybe um, people will have a new appreciation for our cold-blooded friends in our park. Indeed. Thank you so much. And everybody be safe out there. And I look forward to seeing you in the field when it's safe to do so. Thank you so much.